Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Community Church of the Nazarene. That little promo there was for the World Mission Broadcast. In, inside your uh, bulletins, you should have found a little envelope like this. In the Church of the Nazarene, we, one of the pillars that, that we stand for is missions. And this is one of the missions that we support. And so this month, we are looking at World Mission Broadcast. You, you just saw the video on, on how these radio broadcasts are, are going across uh, country lines, across war lines, and this is how it happens. It starts right here with us giving of our means so that people over there who don't have newspaper, who don't have television, can hear of the eternal hope that we have. So as we take the offering in a little while, I would encourage you to place an offering in this as well. Um, you can make a check out to the church. If it's in this, we will write one big check and, and send it. But I want to encourage you to give to World Mission Broadcast so that we can continue to spread this eternal hope that we have. A couple other announcements. Um, again, I trust that you all got a bulletin. I'm not going to read everything in here. But I did want to highlight one thing. Well, actually two things in particular. Next week, next week things are changing up just a little bit. If you're the camping type, this weekend would be the perfect time to go camping because next Sunday we're going to be out at the lake. Details are in the bulletin there. Um, we'll be having our service at 1030 as usual out at the lake. So we will not be here in this building. If you come here, it will be locked. We will have signs up reminding you that you're supposed to go to the lake. Um, because we are heading out to the lake, we will not be having Sunday school here either. So everything will be out at the lake and we will be taking the opportunity to, to share in, in food and fellowship and worshiping our God. And then the week after, this is just the, this is what happens during summer. The week after, we will also not be having Sunday school because the week after is the community worship service. It coincides with the fair. In case you didn't know, the fair's coming up. Um, so Sunday, July 16th, we will all be meeting at the uh, Beulah High School Gymnasium. Um, there is a little typo in the bulletin there. I put that it was going to be starting at 1030. That is incorrect. It will be starting at 10 o'clock. So I will get that updated for next week. But for those who rely on their bulletin, uh, I, I would suggest that you make that change. And again, no Sunday school. I would encourage you to, to read through there and, and be involved in the life of your church. And at this time, if there are no further announcements, if we can have our ushers come forward, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the blessings that you give us and the opportunity to call you Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for who you are and the love that you've showered upon us. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you would draw us nearer to you, that you would deepen that relationship, Lord, that we would, that we would crawl up next to you. Lord, we lift up our burdens this morning. We continue to pray for Bernetta Sapp as she's continuing to undergo chemo and, and all the treatments for cancer. Lord, we've heard report after report from the doctors and they've all been good news. And Lord, we pray, we, we praise you. We praise you that you have done so much in her life and in her body. Lord, we pray that you would continue, that you would continue to strengthen her, that you'd continue to strengthen her family during this ordeal as, as her energy is just non-existent anymore. Lord, I pray that, that you would give her and her family strength to carry about the ministry that you've called them to. The Lord, when this is all over, they can stand firm on the truth that you are the one that healed her. Lord, that they can stand firm on the testimony that you are the living God, able to do immeasurably above anything we can imagine. Lord, we continue to pray for Trisha and Carly and, and the family situation there. Lord, we pray for reconciliation. We pray for healing. Lord, we thank you that you are a loving God and that that's what you do. Lord, you love and you share that love and you pour that love out on us. Lord, I thank you for the good report of Casey as, as he's healing from this horse accident. I pray that you continue to touch him, that you continue to heal him. And Lord, that you would bring him back to complete recovery. Lord, we pray for Jordan as, as she's nearing the end of her pregnancy and she's dealing with everything that comes with that. Lord, I pray that you would comfort her, that you would help this time to, to pass quickly, that the Lord, when that day finally comes, the joy of that newborn baby will completely shadow everything that's happened during the pregnancy. Lord, this morning we lift up Crystal as well as, as she's new to your family, as she is figuring out what this is all about, as, as Lord, you're speaking to her heart. Lord, I pray that, that the moving of your spirit would, would prompt her to, to learn more about you, to draw nearer and closer to you. Lord, may this time of of renewal and, and regeneration never fade. May she continue to grow deeper and deeper in love with you. Lord, I thank you once again for everything that you do, for the work that you do in, in the hearts and lives of mankind throughout this world. I thank you, Lord, that, that you are not absent that even when we don't see your hand at work, Lord, you are moving everything toward your end goal of reunification of, of life eternal with your creation. Thank you, Lord, for caring for us. Thank you for watching over us. Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall on this sanctuary. And Lord, that we would feel your presence. Open our hearts and our minds to hear what you'd have to say. We pray all this, Lord, in your precious and holy name. Amen. There are a handful of Bible stories that every child knows. Whether you've been in church your whole life or you occasionally went to that VBS down the street, certain stories seem to be the ones that are taught everywhere. You'd be forgiven if you've never heard of the time that Elisha made the axe head float. 
You'd be forgiven if you'd never heard of how Ehud stabbed and killed the extremely obese king of the Moabites. However, as much as everyone knows the story about David and Goliath, or Joshua and the walls of Jericho, there is one story that is known far and wide by everyone regardless of religious affiliation. And that story is of Jonah and the big fish. Note that when I was a child, it was known as Jonah and the whale. But we're not allowed to say that anymore. As always happens, people have to find something to pick at. And over the years, people began to argue that, well, due to the anatomy of a whale, a whale could never swallow a, a whole human Let's forget the part that he was alive in its belly for three days. You know, the part that you can't believe is the fact that he was swallowed. And so we had to go back to the scripture and see, well, the scripture doesn't ever say that it's a whale. It just says that it's a big fish. And so relying on scripture and what scripture says, we now say that it is the story of Jonah and the big fish. As with many stories that are adapted for children, the actual message tends to get watered down. So over the next couple weeks, we'll be taking a look at the entire book of Jonah. We'll be digging deeper into the story beyond the cartoon caricatures at, at the message presented in Scripture. From the beginning of the book of Jonah, we get a, a good general idea about the plot, about what's going to happen in this story. Jonah is a prophet of God. We don't know a whole lot about him outside of what we read in this book, but we do see him referenced in the book of 2 Kings. So we know that this was not the only message that God had given him. God had spoken through him on at least two occasions. We're assuming more. Some have tried to dig deeper into this story by, by looking at the names of people, like Jonah. Jonah means dove. And his father, Amittai's name, translates as truth. Some have tried to make reference and and make connections, saying that Jonah is therefore the son of truth, and Jesus is the truth. But that's that's a slippery slope, and it can be dangerous to try and put meaning behind words that don't really have meaning. It's quite possible that that was just his father's name. It had no extra value. My father's name is Alvin. Alvin means elf friend. That doesn't mean that I am familiar with elves, that I have anything to do with elves, that elves are even real. It's just a name. As we continue through these first few verses, that's where we're going to try and limit our scope today, is these first few verses that lay out the entire book before us we see that God has given a special message to Jonah. This message is for the people in the city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. He tells him to go there and tell them of their wickedness in God's sight. We aren't given any more detail about the message at this point. But we've seen situations like this in the past. Throughout Scripture and throughout history, we've seen Societies, societies that have existed, would have flagrantly turned their nose at the things of God. They have completely thrown out God's standard of morality. There have been societies that we have considered downright vile and wicked. And for the most part, these societies have been unaffected by their sinful lifestyles. They've they've dealt with the natural consequences of their actions, but God has chosen to postpone their judgment until the end of the age. However, there are some recorded situations in which a society has been so wicked and so vile that God has decided to bring judgment upon them before the end of the age. The most notable is Sodom and Gomorrah in which God said they were so wicked and they were so vile that he personally sent down fire from heaven to destroy them. We see this also with Noah and the flood. Mankind was was so wicked that God decided to wipe them all out. But even in less severe cases, 
We find the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, all the people that God commanded the Israelites to destroy because of their sinfulness. Now we can imagine that this kind of judgment is what God has planned for the people of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. If we look through history at the Assyrian Empire and, and what these people did and were capable of, they were known as being cruel and brutal. It said that King Ashurbanipal, good luck pronouncing that one, <laughs> took some practice. He was known to tear off the lips and hands of his victims, not cut them off, tear them off. Likewise, King Tilgath Pilasar was known to skin his victims alive. He would make great piles of the skulls of the people that he had conquered. These are the types of atrocities that the people in Nineveh were known for. It should be no surprise that Jonah didn't want to go there. He didn't want to go anywhere near these people. But was that his reason for not wanting to go? I mean, certainly none of us would choose to go somewhere that had a reputation for maiming and killing those who disagreed with them. Surely we can't blame Jonah for not wanting to go. This past week, my family and I had the privilege to go to the Church of the Nazarene General Assembly in Indianapolis. In case you're unfamiliar, this is a, a gathering that takes place every four years. And during this time, Nazarenes from around the globe, and I literally mean around the globe, gather together to take care of some church business, but also to celebrate our unity in Christ. They rented out the, the Indiana Convention Center, a, a huge place, and they, they had workshops and, and booths and, and things set up. Throughout the convention center, they had maps that highlighted all the different areas that the Church of the Nazarene has a presence. Maps highlighting Ecuador, Brazil, Kenya, Japan, Jordan, all these different regions across the globe. Surely, we in the Church of the Nazarene are fulfilling the mission to preach the gospel in all corners of the world. We saw that this morning with the... the uh, world broadcast, I forgot what it was. No, world mission broadcast, <laughs> I knew the initials. If you've read any of our missionary books, then you've read stories of missionaries who have gone to all the corners of the earth to preach the gospel. Missionaries who have gone to remote villages that they didn't even know the language to tell them about Jesus. Some of these stories the families of these missionaries are, are killed and murdered, but, but they still persist to preach the gospel to these people. Clearly, we Nazarenes would not be afraid to go to a place like Nineveh. We've gone to places similar. But I don't think that was Jonah's problem. This was more than just he didn't want to go. Jonah didn't tell God, well, no thanks, I got a great ministry going on here. I'm going to continue to minister to these people. He was so opposed to going to Nineveh that he didn't just ignore God and stay where he was. He got on a boat to go to the other side of the known world, to get as far away from where God wanted him to go as possible. Again, we aren't told Jonah's reasonings in these first few verses. All we're told is that he gets on a boat to go to Tarshish. But if we look a little further into the story, if we jump ahead, during these first few verses, Jonah and God have been having a conversation. They've been going back and forth. And while it doesn't lay it out for us here, later on Jonah references what he and God were talking about. If we look in Jonah chapter 4, we see Jonah's side of this conversation that he's having with God. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran to Tarshish. 
I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. This is Jonah's reason. This is why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Notice his reason is not because he was afraid that he would get hurt. He was not afraid that he would get killed. He was not in fear of his personal safety. He wasn't worried that he'd get his lips ripped off or that he'd be skinned alive. He did not fear the people of Nineveh. Instead, he feared his merciful God. He didn't want God to forgive these people. He didn't want them to be forgiven. He hated them. He wanted them to receive the punishment that he thought that they deserved. At General Assembly, among all the the regional booths and all the the maps highlighting the different areas of the world, there were some uh, areas that they had uh, music from other countries and whatnot, and they had some steel drums out there that people were playing and, and playing classic hymns. It was actually pretty cool. But among all of that, there were booths representing all sorts of things. There were booths uh, advertising trips to, to visit Israel. There were booths advertising short-term mission trips. There were booths that were advertising Sunday school material or VBS material that's coming out. However, amidst all of these booths, one ministry booth stood out. Now, this booth wasn't trying to sell anything. It wasn't trying to push any new ministry into other churches. It was simply celebrating a ministry that God had helped to flourish in a church in Kansas City, Missouri. The booth that I'm speaking of is the Love Wins LGBT booth. This ministry is a ministry of the Midtown Church of the Nazarene in Kansas City, Missouri. Their mission is to be the embodiment of love in a diverse community and to take seriously the call of the Great Commission to make disciples in all communities. They are completely within the uh, the bounds of the Nazarene Code of Christian Conduct. They are in complete compliance with, with God's standard of morality and what Scripture says about this topic. But they first predicate everything with the love of Jesus. As you walk through the halls of of the General Assembly, and you see the diversity that is represented from many nations and cultures, you would think that such a ministry that reaches out to those lost in the depths of sin would be openly welcomed. But that's not what was found. While many were supportive of their ministry and and prayed with them and for them, others were quick to condemn them. They were quick to condemn them as heretics, trying to secularize our church. While it took place in the booth, it was nothing compared to the the outrage on social media and the comments made on their Facebook page. When I look at the Church of the Nazarene, when I see us in all corners of the globe, and I look at the ministry of Love Wins LGBT, I can't help but think about the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. In case you're unfamiliar, the leaders of the church brought this woman to Jesus, telling him the law of Moses commands that we stone her for her sins. But teacher, what do you say? After some prompting, they pressure Jesus for an answer. And he tells them that Whoever is without sin should cast the first stone. One by one, her accusers leave her. While the church of that day was quick to condemn this woman and to cast her out as a sinner, Jesus loved her. Despite all of her shortcomings, despite her sinful lifestyle, Jesus loved her and accepted her. He did not condone her actions. He still held to God's standard of morality, but he loved her where she was. 
as a person created in God's image. Through that love, he then invited her to leave behind her life of sin and receive a new life. See, this is where Jonah fell short. He was willing to go to the ends of the earth to declare God's message. But when it came to those who were steeped in sin, when it came to those that, that he believed were, were sinful to the core, he ran the other direction. He wasn't willing to tell them of God's love and God's mercy because he knew that his God would accept the sinner just as they were, just as Jesus did. And he certainly didn't want that. He wasn't willing to share God's love with them. He took it as a, an us versus them kind of thing. And there was no way that he was going to let them become a part of us. They would water down who we are. It would pollute us and, and dilute us to the point where, where we weren't us anymore. They were sinful and they relished in it. They didn't see any need for God's love and so he was content to let them perish without it. Unfortunately, we in the church often develop the same kind of attitude. We celebrate how accepting we are of other cultures, of other nations. We celebrate our diversity throughout the world. We print logos in thousands of different languages to show that, that we aren't just the local church, but we're global as well. All the while, we shun those that needs God's love the most. We turn away from those that relish in their sin because, well, they aren't deserving of God's love. We don't believe that they deserve it, or, or even if we did tell them, we don't believe that they would ever accept it. And so we don't even offer it. Here's a little spoiler for the end of the book of Jonah. At the end of the book, God's love wins. God's message is preached in Nineveh, the most sinful city in the world. And they repent. Upon hearing of God's love, the message that Jonah didn't want to preach, the message that Jonah didn't want to share with them, they turn away from their sin and they turn towards their loving creator. Through God's love, they were changed. They turned away from their wickedness all because they were shown love and not condemnation. You see, in God's book, that's how it always ends. From the most vile city in the world to a community that the church has abandoned, God's love always wins. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've all been there in our lives. Each of us. At one time, we were, we were a wretched sinner, undeserving of God's love, and God's mercy. But through his grace, he, he showed us his love. He shared with us his love. He called us out of that sinful lifestyle. He has shown us his love, and now he calls us to share that same love with others. We may try to run from it. We may hurl insults at those who try to bridge that gap. But in the end, love wins. We have been commissioned to make Christ-like disciples in all the nations. But while we are looking across the seas to other countries, other nations, other cultures, let's not forget the people, the communities, the cultures right here in our own backyard. Let us seek to not be like Jonah and wish condemnation 
upon those who are lost in sin, those who relish in their sinful lifestyles. But rather, let us seek to be like Christ, to enter into their lives, to show love to those who are lost in sin, to meet them where they are, so that we might show them the same love that Jesus did. Because in the end, love wins. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your example that you have given us. Lord, many times we, we get caught up in, in doing church and, and what it's supposed to look like and how we're supposed to act, but Lord, the example you gave us was messy. Lord, you ate with sinners and tax collectors. Lord, you welcomed in prostitutes, adulterers, those who the rest of the world had cast aside. Lord, you openly embraced them. You showed them your love. Lord, may we be like you. May we not be like Jonah and, and cast aside those who need you most. But Lord, may we stand on your standard of morality, on your goodness, on your love, and share that love with others. Not condemning them, but loving them and showing them that your way is better. Lord, guide us. Help us to minister as you ministered and to love as you love. Lord, guide our paths. Give us opportunities to show your love to others. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.